makes you feel right Little bit of love waking me up Making the sunshine Little bit of love from up above Taking me so high Little bit of love can't get enough Won't you be mine Little bit of love Little bit of well hey everybody welcome back to our channel i'm sarah hey and i'm kevin and we are an american family of six with four kids and a cat who moved to germany from the usa in february of 2021 and we're sharing all of our adventures and travels and experiences with you so today we want to talk about self-reliance in childhood and how it's a big part of german culture Last week, we talked about how our kids are experiencing self-reliance and independence and are getting stronger in Germany. So make sure you check out that video. I'll link it up here and in the description box below. Um, but this week, we're going to share your comments so you can hear what a German childhood is like from the perspective of Germans. So we're excited to share what you've been sharing with us. I put a post in the YouTube community tab. And as of like 20 minutes ago, there were like 146... <laughs> Wait, maybe even more, 172 comments. I don't know. There's a lot of comments. So we tried to pick the top 20. Uh, there are ones that have the most likes um, next to them, uh, ones that got some discussion going. And also I really tried to stick with ones that are more talking about how childhood is today. Because if we were to talk about childhood, our childhoods and my parents' childhood and grandparents, it would you know, be a whole lot different than what childhood in America is like today. So we tried to pick the more current ones, even though we loved reading about how your childhoods were oh, yeah. back in the day. There's so many really yes. awesome idyllic uh, childhoods uh, I, I've been reading about from you guys. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of wanted to give a little background on what self-reliance is, because I know for me, I'm like, what is self-reliance? I mean, we know it's relying on oneself. Okay. But what does that mean? Well, it means Selbstständigkeit. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. You had to throw in a big German word. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's almost the same word in <laughs> Swedish, so I get that one for free. Oh, okay. Oh, that, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Selbstständigkeit. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I looked up the at least English definition of self-reliance. I'm going to read you a few things. It says, reliance on one's own judgment and abilities, decisions, reliance on oneself or one's own powers and resources. Self-reliance is the ability to do things and make decisions by yourself without needing other people to help you. And it's a feeling of trust that one has in his or her own efforts and abilities. And I really love that last definition because I feel like that is key to becoming a happy, well-adjusted, confident adult. If you are not confident in your own tuition and your ability to make decisions, you're really gonna struggle as an adult. You're gonna feel almost paralyzed, you know, right? You can't make decisions. You must ask all your friends or, you know, you can't. I used to feel that way as a young adult. Well, that's, I, that's why it's so important to get this started when they're kids, you know, so yeah. it becomes second nature and try to instill that in your kids as they're growing up. Yep. And definitely we have been learning from your comments on the past few videos about self-reliance and we've been inspired to, to do implement more, more self-reliance in, in our home. Yeah. And we realize in many ways we have been coddling our, our children too much and they need more responsibility and they need more independence. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a big difference between emotional coddling and, and the physical coddling of like practical everyday life things. And I still think it's important to support your our children emotionally. We, we know so much more about that, you know, in this time when there's psychology, you know, a lot more talk about psychology and how, how mental health and all yeah, that. Yeah, mental health and all of that. So I think we still need to strongly support them as far as mental health goes and emotional health goes. But then there's a difference when it comes to, hey, you need to learn to wash your own clothes. You need to, you know, learn cut all your own this. food. Yeah, cut your own food. <laughs> you guys have seen our other videos. You know what we're talking about. Um, and do it right. <laughs> yes, and do it the European and German way. Yeah, right. That's the right way. <laughs> so Anyway, I think there's a difference between those two things. And we definitely 
need to start giving our kids more independence. Well, as our kids are getting older, you know, the older ones can definitely do more and the younger ones can't. And, you know, we're not always yeah. remembering every day of what our capabilities are of all of, of our different ones. kids. You know? Yeah. They all get just lumped in one big group. They and, do. Yeah. <laughs> but they're they're very, at very different stages. Yeah. So we need to set our 10 and 12 year old especially more free. Mm -hmm. And as I was researching self-reliance and looking into the German way of self-reliance, I came across some articles of how self-reliance can be taught to other cultures that don't have the same infrastructure as they do in Germany, like America, for instance, where children cannot walk and ride their bikes everywhere, right? Where it's not safe for children to be leaving their neighborhoods. So how can we be inspired to teach self-reliance at home with a different lifestyle, right? and I'll link to it in the description box below. Uh, so just really quick, it, they say, don't intervene in every dispute between children. Hmm. Try to let them start to figure it out and just be there as a support instead of like uh, an authority figure as a su emotional support uh, and help them kind of work through it. Hopefully too much hair. Too much hair doesn't get pulled out in the meantime. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. They, the article said definitely intervene if there's violence going on. <laughs> right, yeah. That doesn't mean let children start hitting each other. <laughs> um, uh, number two, I really like this one, and I don't know, it just didn't like, it wasn't top of mind for me. But let them order at restaurants. Let kids order at restaurants as young as. I mean, as soon as they learn to talk, they can start doing this at oh, yeah? two and three years old, and it's adorable anyway. The waiter <laughs> likes it. Um, our kids have been doing that since they were young. I remember and it's Ella, especially our youngest. Yeah, she's a take charge kind of person. Yeah, she's a take charge girl. So <laughs> she has been ordering for herself for quite some time. <laughs> Number three, resist the urge to helicopter constantly. And there's been some comments in the other videos I really liked that said that there's sort of a rule in Germany that you don't help children climb higher on playgrounds. If you help them climb higher, how are they going to get back down on their own, right? Then you're going to have to stand there in helicopter, <laughs> you know? So I, I liked that example of sort of illustrating. Although it is easier to climb up than down. So, you know, my, my niece once climbed, you know, like mm. 20 meters up into a tree and then was totally stuck. <laughs> Uh-oh, like a cat? <laughs> yeah, like a cat. Yeah, then you have to call the fire department to come yeah. get your cat out of the tree. But but yeah, I do like that it rule, you know. It will work in every case. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, and I've, you know, I actually come to think of it, I have said that, like somebody said, Daddy, come help me. I'm like, well, you climbed up there, you can climb back down. <laughs> exactly, try it, figure it out. <laughs> right. Use your critical thinking skills, yeah. And then um, number four, don't overschedule. And this is a biggie. Oh my gosh, such a huge problem in the US. You really have to guard against overscheduling your kids in the US. There's all these things coming at you all the time, demanding your child's and, and your attention. And it's a real easy yeah. trap in the US to start overscheduling. Well, even like, you know, they were doing one thing, they were doing baseball and it was, you know, Our boys, yeah. there was practice twice a week and then games on the weekend. So, yes. you know, it was three, Two three, out of three days a week. So, I mean, and then if you put them in a second activity, then basically every day of the week is booked for them, you know? Yeah. So it happens really fast in mm -hmm. the US. And uh, I'm not sure how that is in Germany. I know our kids were joining an ice hockey team and we had heard it was about to increase to be two or three days a week, but it, it didn't happen. So I don't know if it's going to, but we'll so, see. <laughs> yeah. And then number five, when they do demonstrate self-reliance, reward them. And the example they had in the article, which I loved, I was telling Kevin about, is a girl was wanting to order pizza and her mom was busy working. She said, I can't order pizza for you right now. I'm busy working. And so the mom said, well, here, here's the phone. You figure out how to order pizza. If you can figure it out, you can also order a soda as your own reward. And of course, <laughs> the girl figured out how to order pizza and she called and, and did it herself. So I thought that was a great example. Okay, so as I said earlier, I put a post in the YouTube community tab asking Germans and also other Europeans, what does a self-reliant independent childhood look like here? So now we're gonna read the favorite comments that we found for you guys. Yeah. From Anne, it says, in Germany, in our town at least, kids walk to primary school alone and go to playgrounds or friends' houses alone when they're nearby. By the end of primary school, they even ride their bikes or scooters to school and they get extra training at school on how to ride a bike and on a road safety. And they learn the rules of traffic, like when to stop and how to sign when you're turning left, etc. When I was eight years old, I even picked up my little brother, five years old, from kindergarten a few times. It was about 800 meters away and no busy road in between, so it was okay. 
Yeah, uh, and I remember another comment we've seen how you know, all the, the bigger kids in the neighborhood like look out for the other the little kids yeah. in the neighborhood and they can all go together in a big group and go and do stuff because the big ones are always looking out for little ones. That's so cool. Yes, I love that. So Sina Bell says, German kids, at least in my hometown in the north, take little driver's tests. The first is in kindergarten. There the children learn on which side of the sidewalk they should walk in comparison to their caretaker in the street and how to cross streets safely, etc. At the end, they receive a little walking license. The second one is for bikes and it usually takes place in second or third year of primary school. For us, it was fourth year. Yep. After they pass their theoretical test. Yeah, which Grayson did. Yeah. Yeah. Which is part of a class. And the practical part, they drive a, a fixed road through town and they, our son did that. And they receive their biking license. They can bike to school on their own. At least that's how my school handled it in the early 2000s. Christoph Husselbach says, as soon as children here can ride a bike, for example, they're out and about. My younger brother, eight years old, is often riding to the next village with his bike to see if his friends have time to play. No need to make specific play dates. He just has his key and his mobile phone in case of emergency, and if we need to ask him if he'd like to come home for lunch, for example, and a backpack with some water or something like that. We tell him a time he needs to be back, and that is strictly enforced if he doesn't inform us in case he's late. But otherwise, he's free to roam. He knows where to be careful and what streets to avoid, and we could call him any time so we don't worry at all about him. <laughs> we had to move over a little bit because the sun like keeps hitting Kevin in the face. <laughs> okay. So fourth comment is from MC Elgas. I was just walking home from kindergarten without my parents from the age of five. I would always walk with a friend that lived just around the corner. I remember feeling so grown up and ready to take on the world because we even had to cross a big road. Well, we considered it a big road, but it was still in a 30 kilometer mile an hour zone. What we didn't know was that as soon as we came to the big road, his mom could see us from the kitchen window. She would then watch me until I turned the corner, at which, my, at which point my mom could see me. I think it's such a great system to teach a kid how to rely on themselves without being in any real danger or hovering over them. We knew to stick together our moms felt that if we weren't on our own, we could handle walking a few minutes without supervision, but as soon as we got to the road or had to split up, they were looking out for us without coddling us. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. And I'm hoping, I don't know how long ago that was, I'm hoping that's still happening a lot today too. Yeah, and that's actually something I wanted to ask you guys. Let us know in the comments below here, what are children actually doing today as well? Because a lot of these descriptions are what you all have experienced as children and i'm curious yeah. if that's still carrying forward to your children and your grandchildren now yeah is it still safe for children to be walking you know as, as crime increased or or that kind of thing because i know like in the u.s that's a big reason why children aren't so independent because of crime and and danger and things like that posted by noriko says so many nice examples already what i appreciate the most are the skills learned in schools Swimming in second grade, bike license in third, rollerblades, ice skating in the so fourth. Funny. My kids were also taken with the other four classes together to take a day trip to ride with the rollerblades around a nearby lake. I'm glad they had this experience. Also, they have a school garden where they plant vegetables and herbs. Yeah, it's cool. We like how there's more practical skills taught in schools. Yeah, it's not just, you know, schoolwork and math and reading. They, it's they life. Go, and when they go on a field trip, they go and do stuff, go physical stuff or go, uh, you know, camping. go hiking or camping or stuff. I mean, yeah. well, Gabriel, you know, he the other, last week he went for a big, long hike, like a 12 kilometer long hike, you know, yes. with his class, you know, just down along the river. It's just really nice. What a great field yeah. trip. <laughs> right. And he, his, he's we've been he's been counting his steps with his watch. Uh, and mm. I think that was his his new daily record for the most steps in a day was it was eighteen thousand steps yeah, or because something. Because he was at school, you know that's awesome that it yeah. can be that way. Yeah. Nia G says, having lived in the U.S., I think a lot of the framework for self reliance for children is expressed in urban design. I walked to primary school by age five and a half alone, meeting up with other kids along the way. The first couple of days, my parents walked with me to make sure I knew the crossings. 
Afterwards, non-parent adults in the street had an eye on the small ones. Hmm. If you live in a place without sidewalks and safe crossings, a place designated for cars and not people, let alone kids, it is simply too dangerous. Yes, that's mm -hmm. how it is in the US. This is an interesting part of her comment that I really liked. If your community stipulates that you may only take up public space at a driving age, what kind of message is implied in every trip outside the home? You are only an extension of an adult until you are an adult. Don't bother being your own person. Hmm, that's very interesting. Yeah. A lot of insight there. When I lived in America, I had to be driven to a designated place in order to take a walk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because simply leaving the house to walk somewhere was objectively too dangerous with the traffic, even for a young adult. This profoundly shocked me, as the most simple thing I could do with my free time was dependent and at the mercy of an adult with a car. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you get in America mm -hmm. when you turn 16 and can drive a car, it's like a rite of passage. Oh my gosh, I can, get a, I can get a car now. And yeah. I think... You know, getting a car, a driver's license in Europe is not necessarily the big deal that it used to be. Yeah, because they can take the train and the bus and right. car and walk. Right. Kids can get out. Yeah. yeah. And it's so much better for parents because we don't have to be the taxi driver mm -hmm. all the time. And, and I don't know, we have we don't have a 16 year old kid yet that started the drive, but I know a lot of parents feel like, you know, 16 is a little bit death. early, yeah. is a little bit early for a kid to drive, but they have to. I mean, if they're they not, then mm -hmm. they're, they're just can never get anywhere, so. Yep, and it is a little too dangerous. There's many child, there's many 16 year olds who get in car accidents, Yeah, and it can be quite bad, so. Ella09 says, I can only compare German and Canadian kids. Here in my Bavarian hometown school, a school aged children, about six years and older, play on their own. They ride their bikes through town, build little camps in the nearby forest, play on the playground, and so on. They spend their afternoons with their friends without adult supervision. In my Canadian host family, it was a huge deal when the 10-year-old son wanted to go to his friend's house on his own. Same street, next block. Oh my. I, I can relate. <laughs> they agreed on going with him to the street corner, and then they would wait and watch him until he entered his friend's house. To me, the whole thing was totally strange. Personally, I love seeing our Dorfkinder running around, having fun all over town. We always have a little street market on Saturdays. We have no shops in town, and the kids use their pocket money to buy some fruits. Afterwards, they all sit together on the playground and eat their berries or apples. I really think they have much more fun in their childhood than my host kids had. Yeah. Okay, so Marin's Life says, Germany and maybe other countries is known for its Schlüsselkinder, key kids. They, the kids have keys for their house from a very young age, especially when both parents are working long or with single parents. Mostly from first grade on, kids are going home alone, have their keys, and let themselves in the house, and then wait for the parents to come home. My son did the same. He loved being home alone and still does now at 16. He loved his independence, and it made it way more easy for me as a single mom. I don't know, in the U.S., uh, in our town, they wouldn't let the kids off the bus until the, after the age of nine without a parent. A parent had to be there for them to get off the bus. Right. They wouldn't even allow the kid to be yeah. home by themselves. So there's no way you could have, you know, from the first grade, which is about six and seven years old, you know, home by yourself. It's right. illegal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's sad. Tatiana says... My friend's son, five years old, is the one who lights the bonfire in the garden when we're doing s'mores or stockbrot, bread baked on a fire with a stick. Hmm, oh, not, we not don't know that. about that. I've not baked bread on a, on a stick we? before. Oh, yummy. Hmm. They do that in the summer. His mother taught him once how to stack the wood, add some newspaper and light a match, and since he's doing it all by himself. He also receives speech therapy as he is hearing impaired and he goes there alone. Wow. A taxi awesome. picks him up with from kindergarten, wow. drops him off at the clinic, and then he drives him back. The clinic is in another city, so it's not an area he knows well. Wow. That's awesome. Wow. Okay, and I like Anita Brinke's uh, comment because she talks about how self-reliance is taught in the home, like kind of what we were talking about earlier. Toddlers may roam freely in the house. Parents may even designate a drawer or whole cupboard for them in the kitchen where they can put things they can use. Pots and pans, wooden spoons, Tupperware. Nowadays, a lot of people have learning towers for their small children. Yeah, we had one. For the, oh, we had one for like a decade. Yeah. We loved it. 
so they can watch their parents and the children and help with cooking. Yes. Children love to help. You can get children's sized dust scoops and hand brushes, snow shovels and brooms. Oh, and I had a children's sized sewing machine. <laughs> In kindergarten, my son had a few visits from a local dentist where they showed the kids how to brush their teeth. Where I live now, the kindergarten children can go to kindergarten by bus. It's a special one just for them, I think but I'm not sure. Children go to school on their own, beginning in Grunschule, which is elementary school. There are bike driving courses in Grunschule and a little test you can take with the police. Basically, Germans do not prohibit things as much. Rather, we teach the children what to look out for and how to do it correctly. That's great. Jasmine Benesch says, our eldest son goes to elementary school. He and two other kids from our neighborhood walk their way to school by themselves since it's first grade. Driving kids to school is not welcome. The government of our hometown writes an article about this in the newspaper every year. <laughs> I can see that because it clogs up yeah. all the roads and, and creates traffic. Yeah, and well the roads that, are already small. In America, this, 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 like this event, this thing, the, the car line. It's in and, TV shows and movies and everything. And like, so all the cars, they line up and they have all this way of like as efficiently as possible getting the kids out yes. of the car. And you have to, sometimes you have to mm -hmm. sit there for 10, 15 minutes trying to get through this car line. It's pretty crazy. Just let them all walk home. Well, I mean. Let them all take the bus. Yeah, or something. But anyway. It's incredibly terrible for the environment. <laughs> I mean, nobody turns off their cars. You know, you're sitting there with all that gas going. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very inefficient. Right. So Sandra Mule says, it's actually quite simple. Kids want to be big. They want to learn and explore. So if they ask to use a knife and a fork, for example, you just teach them how instead of prohibiting it. Along the way, you explain dangers and set expectations on how to behave to stay safe, to stay safe. At the end, you step back and watch from the distance if they can manage. We have two kids. Our first one was always very responsible. He was allowed to use knives at 20 months, cooked at three, was allowed to play alone in the garden, walked to kindergarten at age four, rode his bike outside into his grandparents' house and stayed home alone. He's now eight years old and can basically do as he wants. But we have some rules. School and chores are first. Always tell us where you're going and who you meet. Be back on time. He learned pretty quickly that sticking to the rules pays off. He visits his friends, playground, the Boltzplatz. I don't know what a Boltzplatz is. Hmm. Boltzplatz. Boltzplatz. Hmm. We'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Uh, tell us in the comments below. He rides his scooter or bike through the fields to go to school and to get ice cream. My two-year-old is a different story. This kid <laughs> needs supervision every minute of the day. I don't see her using knives or helping in the kitchen anytime soon just because she won't listen to anything at all and is just dangerous. Yeah, some kids' personality suits that better than others. Yeah, that's true. And she may catch up eventually. Mm -hmm. She probably will. The Freaker 86 says, in the kindergarten, the older kids are allowed to light a match or a lighter to create a small fire in a fireplace, all under supervision, of course. This may come with an invitation to someone from the fire brigade in order to talk about the dangers involved with a fire. I don't know how popular this is, but at least some kindergartens do it. And if the kindergarten my kids go to eventually does this, I will support it. Rather educate the kids than prohibit it. There's that, that thread again. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll do it anyway in secrecy in unsafe circumstances. It's true. There you go. That's it's sneak true. Sneaky way to do it, right? <laughs> we all know that because we've all been teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> I was perfect. I never did anything like that. Not me. <laughs> 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 Actually, I was a great teenager. I got wild as I got older. <laughs> okay, so SA21DE says, like others said, playing outside and walking to primary school are two different things. For older kids, starting at maybe age 12, they go in die Stadt gehen, which means go into the city. They go into the city. It is a great thing to make them gain some independence. Most towns have pedestrian shopping zones. Yeah, it's awesome. Instead of malls. And kids go with friends for a bit of shopping with their Taschengeld, which is mm. allowance. And for an ice cream is something they enjoy and it also lets them learn how to look after their money or save up for something they want to get for themselves. And that is true in the U.S. A lot of parents... Yeah. Like when we were growing up, you would you get dropped allowance. off at the mall. Yeah, and you'd get an allowance safe. and have to say that. Yeah, and you could go to the mall. Yeah, true. Go to the yeah, mall. Yeah, this is a pretty safe place. But like like the other person was saying, they were dependent on the adult to 
to take get them, them in there. the car to get them there before yeah. they could do it. Yeah, it wasn't truly independent. Otterly Dorky says, every small kid waits for the day they officially become a Schlüsselkind, meaning they become old enough to have a key, often with a chain kept around their neck. For most, that's in first grade, because after one to two weeks of training to walk to school, the kids are usually left alone to do that. After school, I was also trusted to come home and entertain myself until my mom would be home about 4 p.m., including feeding myself. No cooking until I was a bit older, but there were always snacks or small things to eat with until my mom came home. During primary school, 99% of the time after school was spent with my best friend at one of our flats. Our very first attempt at cooking noodles with tomato sauce around 10 years old was a learning experience. Undercooked noodles with warmed up ketchup. I knew, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew to come home after a certain warmed time or when it was ketchup. getting dark or, or when I needed better food. But I'm sure he learned quickly and was able to do it better the next time. Yeah. Okay, Leo Dink says, even primary schools will take first and second graders for a few days to the Schulentheim. Schulentheim? That is houses that are in the countryside that you can rent for sports clubs, music, Verein, which are clubs, uh, church groups, and schools. The Schulentheim is usually close, 20 to 30 kilometers away, <laughs> and the kids will be supervised by teachers. The children will be sleeping in bunk beds and do fun stuff all day outside. I mean, definitely there's a lot of camps in the U.S. too, and um, kids love to go to camps, but they wouldn't be going at first and second grade. No, no, no. and it's not arranged by the school either. No, it's maybe more like 10, 12 mm -hmm. years old once you become a preteen. Yeah. It is always in a rural area with great nature and museums to visit. If a kid gets really homesick, the parents will be called to pick their child up. Some schools plan even camping trips, fourth grade and older. Some schools like to have one night for each school year where the children get to take their sleeping sack the, and um, sleep at school. <laughs> so that's really cool. We don't do that so much here. And I know in our area too, because there's so many ski mountains, they go on ski trips mm -hmm. pre-COVID times, obviously. Um, and with the older children, there are more vacations they do with the school and with the clubs. Mari P says, we teach them to ask for help. We don't help them to open a banana, climb on something, eat or whatever from a very early age, like eight months or so. If they need help, they ask. They need the experience to make it on their own. And when they're older and they have to learn to apologize to their teacher or friends to admit that they've broken something, end of friendships or things like that, we do not give advice if they don't ask for it. And we never expect that they follow our advice. They choose mm -hmm, themselves. I like that. Whenever there is something difficult they must do, I stand beside them. I don't solve problems for them. I wait for them to ask. Yeah, very yeah. respectful. That's awesome. Yeah. And Mari P. also said this, and I really like this comment, and we'll end on this. The most striking and important difference for me is the American idea of becoming a better person, improving yourself. We do the contrary. We teach children to love themselves with all of their faults, which aren't really faults. We focus on other people or characters and stories by teaching them to love, respect, and care about figures that do not correspond to the norm. Hmm. And then it sinks in. If this figure is worthy of love and belonging, then I am too. Even if I have glasses, or if I'm afraid of the dark, or if I'm not very good at writing, or later maybe a drug abuse problem, a divorce, or a bankruptcy, I'm still worthy despite of my mistakes, and they have no effect on my worthiness. Mm. There is no such thing as better persons. Self-worthiness impacts the way you act. If you act from a place of worthiness, you are not afraid of failures. A hundred percent true. Yeah, that's great. And you're usually a great person to be around <laughs> if you feel worthy. You try, you risk, and you relate on your ability to react and to overcome the shame of failure. And the other important thing is what you call, I love this part because it's talking about staring in Germany and I've seen in so many other videos that Germans stare, this whole like thing about German staring. I We have definitely experienced it because we're like this, I always think it's because we're this loud, big, you know, family who's speaking English. <laughs> so this is about the stare. I thought this was so cool. And the other important thing is what you call the stare. We are taught to not look away. You watch, but without judgment. You watch to give the other person the feeling of being part of the community. You show your interest. You want to give other people security. I see you. If something happens, I am here. You feel kind of safe in a society that watches without judgment. 
But this is only healthy if you do not feel spied upon and judged. That is a really deep to topic. That's why we don't have such strict privacy laws. We want to watch and help take care and not to spy and judge. <laughs> and that's the last thing I want to end with is I have noticed this really interesting, I guess, just a juxtaposition try to say that German friends um, and uh, an English speaker can't even say it of how you teach independence and self-reliance so well yet at the same time you also have a strong sense of community and watching out for each other and people being there for each other and I don't know why but for some reason we've really lost a sense of community in the U.S. It, uh, a lot of people feel very lonely and don't feel like they have others watching out for them and I think part of the reason here is because everybody's closer together <laughs> maybe geography has something to do with it because uh, you know, you, you're not too worried that your neighbor can see you walking around in your PJs because everybody's closer together. Every It's normal to see your neighbors in their PJs. It's normal to see them where in America we would consider private moments. Those are more op out in the open here. Mm -hmm. Like like nakedness is more, you know, accepted here. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because people are actually physically closer together. Maybe. Part of it. I don't know. But I think it's really cool how you're teaching self-reliance and independence and at the same time community, community and looking out for each other. Yeah. Which seems like they're opposites, you know. But so let us know more about that in the comments below if you have any insight on it because I think that's really cool. So that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you watch our other videos about German playgrounds and German self-reliance and German childhood because those all relate to what we're sharing today. They kind of all go together. So uh, anyway, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope you're getting some nice sunny uh, summer weather. Yeah, like we these, are today. Last today. five minutes at least. You know, maybe it'll get cloudy <laughs> sooner or later. <laughs> it was raining this morning and it rained half the day yesterday. Yeah. But it was sunny half the day too, so. At least it's sunny now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe we're becoming German because we're starting to complain about the weather. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Cheers. Cheers.